And hello, welcome to the Social Justice Forums. I am your host, Darren Jaime. We thank you for joining us. Now, if you're asking the question, what is the show all about? We bring you a forum, providing and discussing deeper understandings of the issues and inequities that so many people face. Things from systemic inequalities to pressing social problems. Our guests provide multiple perspectives and insights to help us better understand and address these challenges. We invite you to stay connected to us as the Social Justice Forum starts now. Welcome back. Africa Everything is a collective of conscientious creators dedicated to empowering West Africa through academic initiatives. Their mission addresses the pressing challenge of educational access in regions with scarce resources and often inadequate infrastructure. Here now is the founder and executive director of Africa Everything, Aisha Diori. And thank you so much for being with us. Glad to be here, Darren. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And so I want to ask you about this here, because when we talk about really uh, educational enrichment, um, there is a, a cultural disconnect, if you will, in some sorts. Um, bring us up to speed as to where we are when we talk about education, West Africa. Um, so I was brought up in West Africa myself, too. So one thing I noticed is that there was a, there's, a, there's a disconnect happening with making sure that there's safe learning spaces and there's opportunities with what's going on on the ground. So I decided um, about eight years ago to create an initiative that will target and work with empowering youth and young adults on the ground in West Africa um, to either we do infrastructure change, which is, you know, for instance, we had a school that had no roof and the kids were learning and it was raining on them. So imagine that what, what that looks like. So I was able to get the collective together to have an event where we raise enough money to build the roof. We have students that have gotten scholarships from Africa, everything, that now are about to finish college or creating their own businesses. So it's like 360 degree kind of like circular and empowering people for change. Cause you know, if you don't, if you, if you're able to offer it and give it, um, I think it's best because we kind of really create these dynamics where you kind of, you know, pu um, push in the gap because a lot of, as you know, Africa is trending, Africa is the now, and education is one of the most important components and being able to offer that with the creative collection. So it's very grassroots um, fundraising we do to help and 100% of everything that's raised goes back into our projects in West Africa. We talk about Africa is now, that's so, that's so critical because I think it's not just now, it's been, but uh, many people yeah. have just failed to really grasp and really hone in on the fact of, the the gem that Africa is in terms of community, in terms of culture, resources. Uh, I think there's a certain segment of people who really know about it. There's also another yeah. population who's also ignorant to it. Um, and so talk to us about, as you begin to educate people about West mm -hmm. Africa, um, a little bit of the ignorance that's out there for people who should know, but really don't know. <laughs> Let's start with people that still think that that, that you, you're, you're going, the way that you got here to America was by a canoe. Right. <laughs> These are some of the misconceptions, right? And even me, when I was going to college or when I was, you know, when I was, you know, we get the term like African booty, the African something scratcher, this and that, you're swinging from trees. There are people till today, and I'm like, oh, come out, you know, because part of our thing is also taking the diaspora back home so they can learn more. So I'm like, come on my Ghana trip, come on my Nigeria trip. They say, no, I don't want, it's dangerous there. I'm like, it's dangerous there? It's dangerous anywhere that you're at, right? But there's been a preconceived notion of what has been fed to see what Africa is. Africa is cutting edge. They're leading the charge when it comes to tech. They're leading the charge when it comes to social media. Nigeria uses more social media than anybody in the world. So like when you're, when you're talking about Africa is not in the now or those kind of like ignorant comments that were created, like, you know, stereotypes, and things still till this day go on. There are people that will not go to Africa. And there's even a d divide where people that were, you know, they're saying that the ADOS people that are, we're African American, we're, 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 we're Ameri you know, like black Americans, right? And, you know, the black Americans came from somewhere. Right. And they don't <laughs> right. accept it. Right. Uh, that's a huge education. I mean, I think uh, I had, I once had a, a young lady on the show, uh, Mercy Masika. Uh, who is uh, 
you know, done some great things in Kenya, number one gospel artist in Kenya, invited me to come out to Africa and to spend some time with them in Kenya. I went out there, and, uh, and I went out there, and it was so funny because as we were beginning to talk, what we found out was that uh, here in the United States, we're only seeing a certain segment of Africa. And I've been, I've known that for a minute, but really to hear it through their lens, we, they, we only see a certain segment of Africa. But then also to find out from, from their perspective, they only see a certain segment of America. And it's almost like until you get there, you'll never really understand the full magnitude of Africa slash West Africa for this segment. Absolutely. You're, you've hit the nail on the head. I think that that's why um, organizations like Africa Everything are very imperative because we bridge that connect. We let you know that we are all the same people. We are stronger together. You know, we're not we're not we're not siloed. I think one thing we we were divided. You know, I just really say even during transatlantic slavery, everybody was dropped in different spots. Right. But we are still this, we're the same people hailing from some of the same areas and as much, when we start to realize our the things that are that make us you know the same people, we would grow better and start thinking about what we see and what's going on. And I think that sometimes we imbibe media or listen to what others what others or stereotypes are and don't think about what it is that is the truth and not the truth about either places, Africa or here. And as as you can see, there's a movement now. A lot of people are going to Africa, traveling to Africa. And Ghana is choked in December. Everybody's there. But there's mm -hmm. other African countries, everyone. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you got to get out and see. And I tell people, it's, it, you, you, until you visit Africa, um, you have it, you, you've, missed a, you've missed a lot. I'll leave it like that. I can't tell you exactly what I told because we're on television. But uh, yeah, <laughs> I, you, missed, you missed a lot. Let me uh, go here for a moment. Um, when we talk about the work that you're doing, obviously, uh, bringing education to the forefront, educating. Um, let somebody know exactly uh, as they become a part of the organization and find out about your organization, um, some of the groundbreaking work that you are doing. Okay, so um, I can even start, I, I, it, like I said, it started eight years ago. So um, the first event was, you know, a collaboration with creatives to create like a fundraising party Afrobeats event to get people to come and they all had to dress in African wear. So we're amplifying the culture within the stuff that we do and teaching people. I remember that first time we're like, where can I get an outfit? Where can I get an outfit? And that was 2017. I said, there's outfits everywhere. But literally with the money that we've raised, we've been able to impact five different countries so far. We've done Nigeria, Ghana, Liberia, Abidjan, and Senegal. So in Nigeria, we were able to pay for uh, young designers um, schooling as well as get her some supplies for her projects. And now she owns a store uh, with four different tailors. Can you imagine wow. somebody that just started and then we were able to, you know, help foster that. In Ghana, we've renovated three schools. In Liberia, we actually renovated this, the school of Marcus Garvey, the James Stewart School. Wow. It was dilapidated in Liberia, you know, because they had the war going on in Liberia. So we were able to renovate the James Stewart School in honor of Marcus Garvey. So that was a big one. and. In Abidjan, currently we're working on um, renovating a school in Port Boué in Abidjan, which is a fan francophone of West Africa. So we're trying to do one country at a time, but you know, <laughs> fundraising is not an easy task. <laughs> no, no, not at all. And you know, you gotta you gotta keep your feet to the fire when it really comes to fundraising. But I want to go to July because. July, you know, you'll have an opportunity to raise some funds and also make a tremendous impact. July 28th at uh, Slate NYC, you got a very special uh, event taking place. Yes, we do. This is our annual fundraiser. Um, it's held every July um, for eight years. So this is our eighth year. I can't even believe I've been doing this for eight years. Um, so during the event, you get to see and immerse yourself in culture. First things first, like I said, is an African attire affair. That is the dress code because we're going to be empowering our culture. But we have also been um, partnering with Caribbean organizations as well. So we have the African and Caribbean culture in full swing. You should expect like you're on a, a mini Labor Day parade on the, on the dance floor. You should accept fashion from up and coming and amazing African and Caribbean designers, as well as a vendor market where we empower biopic um, vendors to create, you know, like a nice a la carte exclusive market 
to sell their things there. And there's going to be performances, dancers, saxophonists, drummers, you name it, you get it. And literally it is the cheapest all inclusive event that you can go because I want to make sure the pricing was right for everyone because everybody wants to give back, but how can we give back while having to sit down at a thousand dollar table and look at each other? Right. So it's gonna, it's amazing. I will definitely share the um, video with you from last year, Barry, so you can see it. And hopefully I'll see you there. Listen, let's see, July 28th. I have to find out where I am on my calendar. You may see me there. You never know. Uh, let me let me go here. Talk to me about really when we talk about community, right? Because a part of what we're trying to do, you're, you're trying to do, is really impact community, bring about community change, and also um, awareness. As you begin to navigate the local community, educating them about Africa, taking Africa on as you know. A part of your, you know, as a part of your your mantle, uh, what does it mean in terms of community uh, with regards to support, and then also at the same time having a community awareness? Wow, that's a huge question because community is your superpower to me, and having community has been the backbone of what is Africa everything because it takes a village. That saying is exactly what it is. It takes a village, and being able to mobilize and um, get community to buy into what's going on and help in their way. It doesn't necessarily have to be monetary. It could just be your time. And people really leave feeling full because they're they're being a part of change, you know? So for instance, let's say the ticket is $30. You can buy a desk for a child for $30 in, in Africa. So you, you know, you, you're able to do your due diligence and also being able to to teach community and learn from community, I think is very important. I feel like as a diaspora, we have to keep on exchanging and learning from each other. And that's a big thing about our community mobilization work that we do within Africa, everything. And also empowering our local businesses, which is a movement on its own because we absolutely have to empower. And then I also, we also partner with other organizations to bring the Africa field to, the, to their organization. For instance, on August 4th, we have Barclay, we partner with Barclays Center, the Social Justice Fund, to have an event in front of Barclays Afrobeats Takeover. So I want to continue being able to curate and be, be the, you know, as a collective of Africa Everything with all of our board members, um, which is our, our, our organization is totally volunteer based, nobody gets paid everything goes right back to the cause. So when you say community, it's a big part of what it is because without community, I don't think it would have gotten as far as it has gotten today. And when we talk about Africa yourself, you talked about going over and traveling. Uh, what's the experience yeah. like for people who've had the opportunity to go over who may not have ever uh, been there, initial first response? What are some of the responses that you see, you hear, you get uh, after having people, taking people on the experience? Hmm. I've gotten tears, people have cried. Because being able to go through the door of no return and for say in Ghana, for instance, and to, and bringing it back, bring your ancestors back home. So I've gotten cry, laughter, unbelievable, um, unbelie unbelievable experiences like thanks and just people being able to realize that whatever it is that you can get in America, you get in Africa, too. And being able to just mingle with the locals, learn the local language or being able to eat even just the culinary experience of eating African food is a journey for them. So the journey is always so fulfilling. So most of the people that I've gone to, because there's been one or two that maybe didn't enjoy it as much because, you know, sometimes you have to rough it. The light is not 24 seven. Sometimes the light goes out. So what do you do then? Right. You, you, you light your candle and wait for it to come back on. Right. Right. <laughs> but, but you know, when you, when you grow up here and you're from around the way, the first thing that people say is like, I'm not used to that. Then, you know, you find out who gets scared and who doesn't. But the truth is that, yeah, it's a different life, but it's a life that's like really exciting culture, really exciting people. Uh, and not just exciting when I say culture and people, but really exciting to have the experience of being around your own and seeing such great progression. Oh my goodness. It's, le it's leaps and bounds when you see the progress, the architecture, the roads, like everything is just so, like they have such stunning homes in Africa. They're, they're just, you know, it's just, it's different. It's a different vibe. And also it's not as stressful. Like when you're here, you know, New York City, America can be stressful. 
yes. for sure. So being able to have a place where you have peace of mind. You have peace of mind. And a lot of people have the same coloring as you. Right. Everybody kind of looks like you, right? And it feels good just to be able to say that we're beautiful in all of our shades and hues and we're not being discriminated against. We're being adored. And I think a lot of people honestly end up moving back. A few people that I've taken there are now living living in Africa. See, <laughs> I, I look, I, I'm not surprised at all. When we talk about education, I want to go before we uh, close down a little mm -hmm. bit about because you're doing great work in supporting, you know, West African education. But before we go, I know as we fundraise and do things to help mm -hmm. with West African education, um, share with our viewers a little bit about what are some of the major challenges that you're seeing um, when it comes to West African education? Oh, that's a great, that's a great, great question. Infrastructure is one of the biggest challenges for me because a lot of the schools were built during colonial times and a lot of the um, leaders are not maintaining the schools. So the schools are getting dilapidated. And you know, when you're learning, you need a safe space. The kids don't care. They will learn in a, in a room without windows or a dirty floor. But I think that the fact that the infrastructure of so many schools are being having to get fixed. And if you're not in private school, you don't have the money to pay for private school. Right. What happens then? That's very important. And also money to further your education. For instance, when you graduated from senior high school, which is our which is equivalent to our high school here, some kids don't have money to go to college, you know? So being able to help with getting supplies and getting, you know, infrastructure, also did their desks, their basic, even their desks. And their chairs, some of them are broken, it's quite simplistically. They're kind of sharing space in little spaces. These are some of the things that um, come up. And sometimes it could also be a basic need like meals, you know? For instance, we have a school project we did in Jamestown, um, Jamestown Baker Bay School. The kids don't eat. A lot of the kids were orphans, so they don't really get, they don't, they don't get to have one square meal a day. Mm -hmm. So just being able to, help from fostering some of those things and filling some of those gaps and those holes are very important because if you reach one, to me, even if I reached one child through Africa, everything, we reached a million because one can then piggyback to another one and they can also empower the movement on their own as well too. Yeah. So Aisha, before we go, how do people connect with uh, Africa Everything and then also, you know, on social media? Yes, yes, thank you so much. AfricaEverything.org is our website. Go on there, check it out. Learn more about the work we are doing. We are also on Instagram, Africa.Everything.NYC. Make sure you're following and it's, we're, very, we're very responsive. You send a message. We're on LinkedIn, Africa Everything. We're on Facebook, Africa Everything. You can find us anywhere. And this, so just make sure you check us out and come and join the movement. The movement is for everyone. We want everybody to, to take efficacy and do, help us do this work. Well, Aisha, it's been great having you. Thank you so much for the work that you are doing and making a difference, not just locally, but making a difference globally. And so certainly appreciate you. And thank you for being with us and sharing. Thank you for having me, Barry. All right. Take I'll care. Be back now. Soon. All right. <laughs> We're taking a quick break, and guess what? We'll be have more, we'll have more right after this. Hello, my name is Tyrone Lowe. I host a show at Bronx that called The Legends, where I bring real legends, DJs, upcoming artists, actually people from the past that was at, that's into entertainment. Um, I want to thank Bronxnet. First of all, I want to thank you know, I want to thank you know for the thirty years of of the actually being active here. It has opened a lot of doors for me to the point where I'm branching off to have my own network. Fulfill your dreams here. That's all I have to say. Hey everyone, it's your girl Kat from the Kitty Rose Lifestyle, also from the next chapter, where we discuss shades of gray every week right here at BronxNet, Saturdays at 11 p.m. Wow. 30 years, 30 years of BronxNet public access television. 
I'm a girl from Brooklyn and came to the Bronx 25 years ago, started my journey on BronxNet on public access television in 2016. And BronxNet is where I got my start. BronxNet, I feel like, is a home away from home. They support all of my endeavors, and I wouldn't have been able to be on any of the other channels if it wasn't for the fundamentals that I learned right here at my start here at BronxNet. So I am so appreciative. My son says I should stop telling people I'm from Brooklyn, because I've been here now, Bronx Storm, for 22 years. So I'm so grateful, and I wish you much success in 30 years, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30 more, because public access is necessary so that people like myself can have a voice. Yes, BronxNet, it's your girl Kat from Kitty Rose. Check me out every Saturday at 11 p.m. right here, Channel 68, the next chapter, where we discuss Shades of Grey. Mwah. And welcome back. Latino Justice Parole Def is a national Latino rights, civil rights organization, I should say, that's committed not only to advocating for civil rights, but also increasing the number of Latinos in law school. Their initiatives particularly emphasize the journeys of women and mothers who challenge societal norms, overcome obstacles, and lead the way towards a more inclusive legal profession. Now, according to the American Bar Association, women now outnumber men in law schools, dem demonstrating a 13.4% increase. Here now, Latino Justice's Director of the CAP Leadership Institute, Lydia Diaz, and class program alumni, Denise Cowell. And uh, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Darren. Thank you. And uh, when we talk about Latinos in law school, obviously, uh, one of the initiatives is to really increase that. Uh, what what are we seeing right now when it comes to law school and Latinos? While we're seeing better numbers, the, the increase is not significant enough, and we're also not seeing Latinos rising up the corporate ladder. So for us, the pipeline programs continue to be really important, um, and especially as a result of the Supreme Court case um, on affirmative action. Uh, you know, there is a sentiment that the number of Latinos uh, in undergraduate institutions are going to go down and therefore also in law school, you're going to see that number decrease. And so we're just, you know, plugging along and doing our job and continuing to bring these programs uh, to the Latino community and folks that are underrepresented. And when we talk about that underrepresentation, obviously that's huge. That can be a, you know, that can fall out in a variety of different ways. Uh, by not seeing people uh, of Latino descent in law, what does that mean for community and what does that mean in the overall grand scheme of things? I think overall, um, it makes it harder to visualize yourself as an attorney. It makes it harder to visualize yourself as an attorney in a corporate space, um, not having anyone to guide you, to mentor you, and to just provide the like little tidbits of information that you get when you know someone who is an attorney. Um, and I think class has really been essential in providing that and providing mentorship and connecting like the small amount of Latinos that there are, connecting them with like younger Latinos to continue mentoring them. Yeah. And, you know, Lydia, I'll talk, ask you this question because exposure makes a whole lot of difference. And when you uh, have exposure and your organization does a great job of providing that, um, what does it mean in the lives of students to be able to get this level of exposure? It means so much. And we start young. Our first program in our pipeline is called the Next Generation Lideress Mentorship Program. And it start, targets students as young as juniors and seniors in high school. And for them to be able to visualize, see, get in touch with, ask questions in a setting that is intimate and allows for vulnerability and also genuine responses, authenticity, makes a huge difference. Um, we're seeing them, you know, come back program after program, build relationships and rapport with, uh, you know, with staff, but also our external stakeholders that serve as mentors um, and panelists to be able to guide these students as they continue on this pipeline, whether it ends up being in law or in a, or in a different professional space. Um, but it just makes a huge difference. We get emails years later. If it wasn't for your program, I wouldn't be an attorney today. If it wasn't, and this dates back to the inception of the organization. The organization was founded in 1972 and has always had education as part of its mission. And we run into attorneys 
all the time that say, had it not been for your LSAT prep program, had it not been for the scholarship program that y'all had, I wouldn't be an attorney. And even for me serving in this role over the last three years, I get emails. Had it not been for my mentor, I wouldn't have understood the application process. I wouldn't have understood the different possibilities and the different ways to practice law. Um, so really it is an invaluable resource. Yeah. Denise, when you talk about being that student now, law, you know, and, and, and also working in law, there's a lot of juggling that goes on, right? And I mean, obviously the balance is there. You got to create a, a, a plentiful balance between work and life. And talk to me about that and, you know, really the balances that you've had to deal with uh, coming up. I think um, to give you some background, so I applied to law school with a six-week-old baby. Um, and I started law school with a six-month-old baby. And uh, now that baby is four, about to be five years old. And I'm working as a first year in a big law firm, Oric. Um, and balance is crucial. I mean, I think some of the other first years are surprised at like waking up at five in the morning. And I think when you have a baby, if you have one, um, you know, like five in the morning, that's normal, right? That's like the newborn's time to wake up. So I think in some ways, like having a, a baby young has instilled this like a routine and a schedule for me. Um, I will say it's challenging now because my, my schedule is unpredictable. Uh, and when you start off at this like first year, you uh, don't have control over your time. So one of the biggest things for me is having a support system and having my family. Um, for example, like I had a three day all nighter and I was like sitting next to my son having dinner. Um, so you just kind of balance it. I think a lot of moms and all moms that I know will tell you, um, we just make it happen. We make it happen under whatever circumstance with whatever resources we have at hand. Yeah. And Lydia, women in law are really making a, a huge impact. I mean, I think when we look at society right now uh, a long way we've come but honestly still a long way that remains ahead i think that's right um you know what we're seeing in our programs is more and more women latinas seeking these resources they're not afraid to go for you know this ultimate dream that they've always had we have had um you know adult women come and say look i put this dream off aside to really prioritize my children, my family, and the things that I needed to do. But now this is something that I've always wanted to do and coming back to it. We're also seeing you know, young moms that say, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna have the baby, I'm gonna have the family, and I'm gonna have this legal career. Um, and so we are seeing a spectrum of students that are coming to our programs and seeking these resources. And we are here, we are here to help and assist um, and continue to, to push that, that trajectory and to push the conversation um, and to really, you know, anything is possible. Right. You know, as an intern to the legal field, everybody knows it's going to be, you know, quite intense. It's going to be a lot of hours. I think Denise has already, you know, pointed to the fact of, you know, the family time that's involved and, you know, having not m much time, but then still incorporating family right there in the dynamic. Um, in order to navigate something like this, mentorship is very key and very critical. Uh, I first want to talk to you, Lydia, and I'll ask, and I'll come back to Denise in a minute. But I want to ask about that that point of mentorship because, um, you know, it can be make or break for a lot of people without mentorship. Uh, so look at Latinos in, in 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 law, the power of mentorship. I'll let you answer. Yeah, I mean, mentorship is crucial at every stage, is what I would say, which is why that first program we have starts as young as juniors and seniors in high school. Um, you know, the reality is that there's still not a whole lot of Latinos or people of color in the field. Um, and so when you're looking at it, like Denise shared earlier, and you don't see yourself, it's hard, right? It becomes, it feels like an obstacle, a challenge. Oh, this is something that's not done. Can I do this? Maybe I can't do this, right? On top of uh, financing law school, the LSAT, uh, you know, those prep programs are really expensive. And so the challenges are there. Um, and then we have, again, Latinos and people who are underrepresented being first generation into the field, and they don't have the resources, they don't know the jargon. Uh, you know, law school is very different than undergraduate studies. Um, so the way that you study, the way that you prep, the way that you show up to class, the way a class is run is very different. So we also have this program for 1Ls called How to Succeed in Law School. It's a one-day workshop 
but it gives them that sk that skill set, how to case brief, how to outline, you know, what is the language and terminology that you need to have as you, you know, are approaching law school. And then we have that class program that Denise did that again is about access um, where we partner with Fortune 500 companies and top firms to create, you know, an avenue for students that may not necessarily have had that avenue to get into these fields. Um, and then we have um, our Lead as Young Professionals Board. So really the mentorship that we have is across that trajectory from as young as juniors and seniors in high school, all the way to practicing attorneys and practicing professionals who still need that mentorship and that allyship in the field, um, you know, so that they are aware of obstacles and challenges, how to overcome them, um, the networking that comes from it. Uh, and so it goes back again to something that we mentioned earlier, exposure, right? Right. Um, and so we try to do that all through all through the pipeline. And Denise, for you, how important was it to have a mentor in this process? I mean, obviously a lot to contend with, uh, but the power of mentorship for you. I think it was like pivotal for me getting this job. Um, Rochelle literally spent several nights with me interviewing. We practiced again and again and again. Um, we practiced our questions. We practiced what would be asked. Like the amount of time that she put into me preparing for this interview was even looking at where was I sitting? How was the interview going to look um, to the interviewee? And I think, honestly, I don't, the thing, the insight that she had, I would not have had at that stage. Um, and she already worked here. She already worked at org. She she knew the people that I was going to interview and had a sense of like the questions that I was going to be asked. Um, and I, you know, I'm eternally grateful for all the time that she's given me. And and in the grand scheme of things, it hasn't been over years. It was just like a focused period of mentorship um, that made a difference for me. Yeah, I want to look at some gender disparities when it comes to the legal profession and take a look at it here. Uh, Latinos make up about 19% of total U.S. population, but only 4.8% of practicing attorneys and 6.6% of federal judges. And when we talk about that, that's a very startling statistic to see that only 6.6% uh, of that 19 are actually hitting the bench. That's exactly right. Um, and you see that across the board, across fields in the legal field, you see it, uh, you know, in partners, when you look at firms and partners, but you see it, like I said, across the field. And so we continue to do those work because it continues to be important. And the other thing, Darren, that I would elevate is that the Latino population is only going to continue to grow. Right. It's going to be greater than that 19%, right? And we're not seeing the same uh, increased rate into books that are going into the profession. So we need to really take a look at what those obstacles, challenges, and barriers are and how we are working to dismantle them, uh, you know, so that the playing field becomes becomes equitable yeah. and accessible. Well, Lydia, I think you have a great program, and I think that people really need to be exposed to that and really take advantage of the opportunities that are right there in front of them uh, to help to advance them as such, you know, a troubling, not a troubling, I mean, it's a very adventurous and it's a very profitable uh, profession, but yet and still, <laughs> there's still some challenges. And sometimes people say, listen, I'm not gonna get into this because I'm so worried about the time constraint. I'm so worried about the study. I'm so worried about having the support and the mentorship that I actually would need in order to make that. But you guys do that so well. Um, let me ask about somebody who might potentially be watching right now and saying, I wanna be a part. Um, I wanna take advantage of this opportunity. I think maybe I'll cross the border and, you know, literally go here in this area of, uh, of uh, you know, of law. Talk to me about that. How do they get in? So, Darren, they can go to our website at latinojustice.org, where we have the CAP Leadership Institute page that lists all of our programs. Um, I will highlight that, you know, the pandemic caused us to rethink how we bring about programming. And so a lot of our programs are hybrid. We offer webinars, so folks that are not in the tri-state area you know, can can join us for programming. We also have in-person programming. Like I mentioned, we have the mentorship program. We have a law bound um, academy, which is for students that are a little bit closer to the application process. We have law day, which is a law school fair, which we host uh, typically in the city um, in the fall. And so we have all kinds of events. Certainly follow us on social media, sign up for our newsletter. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, I will post our programs as they're coming up. So there's definitely different ways to to find us and get involved. Yeah. And for the summer, I know that you got some things happening. So I do want to get a chance to let you talk a little bit about the summer. 
Yes, so our next uh, panel that we have coming up is a webinar focused on folks that are interested in being paralegals and that's scheduled for June 10th. Then, like I said, we will have the How to Succeed in Law School workshop in July. We will also have an alumni event in July and then our summer law bound uh, program, the application is open and that takes place July 29th through August 2nd. So we do, do ha have a lot of programming that's coming that's coming down the pipe and we do a monthly webinar for the NGL. So if, again, if you follow us at latinojustice.org and you follow us on social media, you'll see all of the monthly webinars that we put together. Yeah, Denise coming along, what was the biggest challenge so far in the journey? Um. What a good question. Um, I think it's it's really more of a mental challenge. Um, and I think that's why class was so important, but it's really having the mental fortitude because you can, you can learn how to study, you can learn the jargon, you can learn and understand what's going on. Um, but I think having the mental fortitude of I can do this, like I'm not alone, I like overcoming imposter syndrome um, and there's, and that's why I think community is so important. Like mentorship is really tied to this like idea that you're welcomed into this community. Uh, so I, I would say, you know, please reach out to class. Please find like other people who will encourage you. Because if you have that mental fortitude, you have all the other things that, that can happen, you can make happen. Yeah. And what was your favorite part for uh, within this journey? What's been the favorite part for you? <clears throat> I think my favorite part has been learning, honestly, my favorite class and my favorite part was constitutional law. Um, just like understanding how do we create big ideas and how do we, how do we change society? Um, I think the law is a language and it's, and you know, I grew up bilingual and translating and I think the law is a way to translate into new fields. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've loved it so far. Yeah. So, Lydia, again, uh, we're going to give people an opportunity, those who've been watching throughout the course of this segment, to have a chance to connect. Uh, and so, if people want to get connected with uh, Latino Justice, uh, how do they go ahead and do that? Latinojustice.org. We are on Instagram. We're on Facebook. We're on LinkedIn. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. You can find me, Lydia Diaz. Uh, I'm not difficult to find with a name like that. Uh -huh. um, and certainly signing up for our newsletter. Yeah, and uh, as we continue to study and find out more about uh, how we're moving as a society, one thing that we can definitely say is that there is a need for greater diversity and there is a need for uh, inclusion when it comes to the area of law, particularly minorities, and in this segment, talking about uh, Latinos in justice. And uh, thank you so much for being with us, both uh, Lydia and then Denise. And we gotta have you back. Thank you. Sounds good, Darren. Thank you so much. All righty. You take care. Take care. All righty. Well, listen, we are taking a quick break, but guess what? We'll have more coming back right after this. Thank you, Bronx Ned. Congratulations on 30 years. What an amazing accomplishment. On behalf of myself, Alina Dow, and I represent the Dow Twins and the Dow Twin Show, who are young producers they are they started i think when they were 11 and now they're 14 they started making 30 second little fun facts and now they are doing 30 minute shows and it goes to a testament of how much you guys do in the bronx to make young people want to continue to be involved i wish you 30 more amazing years and beyond thank you for what you do Seven percent of New York City high school students are college ready by their senior year. Fifty-five percent of high school graduates either have no plans to attend college or are uncertain that they will ever attend. Thirty-four percent of young adults don't go to college because they can't afford it. 
Discover what's possible. BronxNet's education programs, internships, and opportunities help engage and inspire Bronx youth and beyond to pursue their passions. Be a part of the BronxNet family. Whether you're interested in our shows, joining a class, or donating to support our mission, visit BronxNet.org to learn more. And we are back. Seeds of Fortune Incorporated is a not-for-profit that's committed to empowering young women of color on their financial, or I should say, on their journey towards financial security. Now, using a comprehensive approach, the organization provides members with the tools and resources needed to succeed in today's economy. Join me now as the founder and executive director of Seeds of Fortune, Nataya Walker. And uh, Nataya, thank you so much for being with us. It's so wonderful to be here today as well. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And so for somebody who may not be so familiar with your program, uh, talk to us a little bit about the organization. So Seeds of Fortune is an online platform and a scholars program that helps to financially empower young women across New York City and beyond in order to get to college with the least amount of debt, but also be able to explore high income earning careers as well. So that's us at Seeds of Fortune. We've gotten our girls $45 million in scholarships and are celebrating our 10 year anniversary this year. Amazing, $45 million is no small number to uh, look at. What do you say about the college experience? Because it can be so overwhelming for a parent that's trying to put their child through college. And then also that, you know, that, that student that's trying to really move on to that next chapter of life. There's, it's a high hurdle sometimes, it's a high hurdle. But, you know, when you talk about making college affordable and then also accessible, I think that eases the pressure for both student as well as parent. No, definitely. Sometimes the student and the parent are not quite on the same page huh. sometimes, <laughs> unfortunately. But I think the biggest thing that really parents and students both need to think about is that it's really what is the return on investment that the college is going to provide to you at the end of the four, two or four years um, that you will be attending. Especially, I think a lot of times in New York City, right, you're thinking like your, your education so far has been pretty much free unless you went to Catholic or private school. Um, so sometimes students go into a mindset with that as well into the college process, but it really is a financial decision that you and your parents are making. So really when they're thinking about the college process, how many students are leaving this college with careers, right, job placement, or some type of skill set that is going to make you employable by the end of it. Is this a uh, environment that graduates its students, right? So looking at the graduation rate of that institution in college before committing um, to it this year, the financial um, aid process has gotten a little um, delayed because of the new changes with FAFSA. How is the college responding to that? Did they provide you a financial aid package on time? Did they decide to meet with you and your family to go over your financial aid package, provide you additional aid and scholarship to be able to support um, your way through your college education? These are a lot of things that parents and students really need to be thinking about. The great thing, I think, in New York City, which is kind of like a hidden gem that a lot of New York students don't really know, is, is that our CUNY and SUNY colleges are nationally ranked across the country. So you can be getting almost a $90,000 value degree, right, for $10,000 a year. So these are some of the things that parents and students really need to be researching and looking at and seeing what's the best fit college, and that will open up accessibility and financial affordability for them. So for people who want to participate in the programs that you have to offer, obviously college preparedness is one, um, really just also the leadership, right? There's a college prep leadership program that you also uh, do with Columbia University. Yes, yeah, so we have our College Prep Leadership Program that is coming up this fall. Applications will open on July 31st, but you can get on the wait list right now. We take seniors in high school across the five boroughs through the college application process, your college essay, what do you need to put on your activity section, what's the Common App, but then also to give you that college experience by being on Columbia University's campus and being surrounded by students that also want to go to college or have the desire or want to understand the next steps to be able to go to college. 
And then the event ends with a dinner with 15 other college partners we have across the country so that the students can learn leadership and networking skill sets. We all know that a lot of times business is conducted over a nice meal or over um, dinner. This is a really great opportunity for the students to learn professionalism skills and put themselves out there and explain to the colleges why they're the best fit for them. But then on the other side for the colleges to also explain why their college is the best fit for our students. Um, that. Um, I, the program will take place on October, um, starting October 8th, and will run through oh. December of 2024. So we're super excited to have students apply, and we really look forward to the impact that we're going to have on the class of 2025 next year. You know, that's valuable. The word is use impact, right? Because I think when you really put these tools to use, um, there's an impact that can be felt across, you know, students. When we talk about students, Many times access to resources is present, but not really easily accessible. And then sometimes it can be accessible, but then not even, I would say, relevant sometimes to what they really are dealing with. Uh, but it seems as though that you understand what that is that needs to be accomplished in the life of a young person. Um, for yourself, talk about navigating that process. How much of your frustration, if you will, how much of your experience do you say, I bring to the table and say, you know what, I had to go through this. I don't want this to be somebody else's experience. Definitely. Growing up in New York City and trying to navigate the New York City public school to college system was quite confusing. Um, I went to a pretty good high school, but we had about 1,000 graduating seniors, and we, have a, we had about five college guidance counselors that were supporting that magnitude of students. So where there is maybe accessibility, there might not be equity, right? Because it's a lot for the college counselors to take on to help every single student navigate successfully. For me, I had a Girl Scout troop leader, Phyllis D. Pearson, who was a scholarship guru. And she was great. She worked with me for six weeks in the public library and taught me how to get scholarships, taught me the different parts of the system of the college application process. And I know that if it wasn't for her, I would be I would have been totally lost. My mom, we got our first college bill. It was about fifty thousand dollars for the first year. And at that time, that's almost like three fourths of like my mom's salary. So how would we be able to afford that for me to be able to have a college education? Right. And you know, that really inspired me to be able to start Seeds of Fortune because somebody paid it forward for me and I wanted to pay it forward for, for others. And we're excited to have been doing that um, for the last 10 years. You know, you're paying, it, you're, you're paying it forward in a lot of different ways, uh, Natalia, that you've got this leadership you're talking about, but then also I want to talk about your young ladies. And there's a girl startup accelerator uh, that you have. And uh, give us a little bit more insight into that. Yes, they started last week with the Girl Startup Accelerator. Um, 21 students were chosen um, across New York City and beyond to be able to cultivate their startup businesses. So we really strongly believe here at Seeds of Fortune that in order to change things for the next generation, our girls have to be social impact oriented. So all of their ideas have some type of social impact driven lens to it and is reflective of the communities they come from. On top of um, them developing their social impact ideas, they will pitch their ideas at BMO Capital Markets and Times Square, which is one of our corporate partners. And then they will be flown out to Miami to pitch for $6,000 in grand prizes with the Grant Cardone Foundation in Florida. But if that wasn't even enough, we decided that, you know, sometimes it can be very hard to be an entrepreneur and really try to put those business skills to the test. So we decided to give them an internship during their time period where they would be learning business skill set, asset management, and really seeing how these business skill sets that they're learning in their business can apply to the real working world. So we're very excited for them and we know that they're going to do great things and um, looking forward to next year's cohort when it opens up in the summer of 2025. And what does that mean to have young girls have that kind of exposure at an early age uh, to really get the mindset of business, to get the mindset of really saying, listen, uh, you can get ahead of the game early on? It definitely is very impactful. When we look at the stats today, only about 3% of venture capitalist funding um, go less than 3% go to women and then even a small percentage to women of color. So when we're looking at those odds um, kind of stacked against them, we really have to be able to instill in them confidence from an earlier age, 
um, the ability to be able to think clearly and, and articulate their ideas, that them just have that confidence to know that their ideas are valued and that they're going to face obstacles. But here, here in Seeds of Fortunes, where we believed in them first, to be able to nurture, no one pun intended, that seed or idea that they had um, to go on to greater heights. You know, you got a very valuable career already, and, uh, you know, you're listed in the 30 under 30 by Forbes. Uh, you've done some tremendous things. Where did you get the energy to say, listen, you know what? I'm starting out, I'm, I'm, I'm aiming high, and I'm not looking back. For me, I really think it came down to, like, me looking back into my community. I went to a college. I was in a very wealthy neighborhood, and then I would come back to my neighborhood which was struggling from a lot of poverty, a lot of violence. And I just knew that this couldn't be the future that we gave the next generation to. And I feel like that was a flame that ignited me to be able to really year over year come back and do the college process with the students. And I think now, you know, in our older tenure as an organization, it's our students and our alumni that now in their working fields, seeing them climb socioeconomic ladders from um, where their parents were to where they are, seeing first-generation students have opportunities that would have been very difficult um, many years ago for them to be able to access. It just really is a, is a cycle of positivity and uh, going back to what you said, impact, that is really going to change our communities for the better moving forward. And I feel like that's the flame that ignites me to keep going. Every people out there who are watching right now saying, you know, listen, this is a very talented young lady. She's got a great organization, may want to take part in some of the things she has coming up in the future. What does the future look like for you and what do you have uh, on tap? Yeah, so for us, you can get involved with Seeds of Fortune. We have um, decided that, you know, we want our students to be global citizens. Um, so we expanded um, our outreach to Ghana. So we have our U.S. students. I'm working with students, our student scholars in Ghana. So if anyone's interested in like international relations or making the world a better place, taking New York City to the world, we would love to have you. We're also having our 10 year anniversary coming up on June 13th at Chase Harlem um, branch. So if you would like to get involved, please go to www.seedsoffortune.org slash awards. A lot going on there. Definitely. <laughs> Talk to me about inspiration. Who are your inspiration uh, as you look to, you know, bring inspiration to your community? Is there anybody, a community activist or something that you say, hey, you know what, they're doing it. I want to learn how to do it like that. You know, it's so interesting. I think that coming from like an entrepreneurial landscape and just seeing like the impact that women have had in the business world, um, there's a, a New Yorker, Tiffany Dufu. She is now the executive director of the Tory Burch um, Foundation, and she's helping women entrepreneurs to be able to get funding as well as leadership skills to be able to sustain their businesses. And I feel like that's so important in today's society to have women that you know, want to uplift other women, but she also was able to sell her um, for-profit company that gathered women to be able to help them navigate their mid-level careers. And I feel like that's what we do here at Seeds of Fortune. We take um, the New York City girls that have dreams and aspirations and are looking out their window thinking like, I want to be a lawyer someday. I want to be a doctor someday. And we're cultivating a community for them. So I feel like, yeah, that's, I look up to Tiffany Dufu. I think she's amazing. And I think she's cultivated a community for women. Um, and I'm looking forward to, you know, making similar impacts in the future. What's the conversation like in the space when it talks about what's go in your space, when he talks about gender equity, um, you know, the pay gap and really just opportunity. What are you hearing? Yeah, I feel like for us, it really comes down to trying to really close those gaps. But I think in most recent years, I think with any progression, there's a fear, right? A fear of the unknown, fear of those that are in power structures that want to take some of those advancements away. Um, for us, we have looked at the McKinsey report that said only 5% of women make it to the C-suite, um, of color make it to the C-suite. So for us at Seeds of Fortune, we see that these are some obstacles on the horizon. So in our curriculum with the girls, we've really started to have them be able to advocate for themselves, right? Because you're talking about the um, gender pay gap. I know a lot of times when um, young people or even um, mid-level career and early, um, late career, 
when you go into a job interview and they ask you like, what's your salary, right? What did you make before? What are you intending to make here, right? Making our girls very crafty, um, new labor market. So like starting all the way from the college application process, we tell our girls like negotiate with the colleges, like go back and appeal for more money, right? right? Because you've done this, that, and the third. You've got A's in here or you were part of your community um, service um, team at school. And the girls, they will go and they will advocate for more money on their behalf for their college education. And they will come back a lot of times with more money from the universities because the universities value them. And I think that those like example of that kind of skill set will transfer over for them in the future to a labor market that can sometimes be unjust and unfair. There are things that are progressing, but there are challenges with some of the regression um, happening. The great thing is we're in New York, so Mayor Adams has um, put in a $43 million investment um, in making New York City one of the most woman-friendly cities in the country. Um, So I think we're ripe and ready for the future. When you talk about New York City, obviously, uh, Mayor Eric Adams has had his share of uh, both sides. You know, it's been good, it's been bad, but then at the same time, people have wondered, uh, you know, where does he stand on certain issues? Looking at the fact of what he's done right now, talk to me about just that and what that means for uh, the gender, what that means for, uh, you know, really empowerment. Definitely. Um, There's actually a new initiative that has launched um, by the mayor's office um, called Future Her, which is investing in women and women of color specifically um, to have a whole um, agency or section of the New York City mayor's office that is focused on making New York City more equitable for women and girls. In particular, um, what I was um, esteemed to be a part of a couple of weeks ago was a think tank where they brought on educators, they brought in nonprofits, they brought in for-profits for all us to come together to really think about what are the inequities that women and girls of color are facing in New York City from a socioeconomic perspective, from an education perspective, and from a labor market perspective to be able to break down these barriers and collaborate on resources to make the community better. So I'm very excited for the future of New York City and, and what it has to offer for women here. Yeah. And Natalia, before we get out, uh, let's get people an opportunity to get connected to you. If they want to get connected to you in the organization, what do they do? Yeah, so you can definitely find us um, on our website, www.seedsoffortune.org, or you can email us at hello at seedsoffortune.org. We're happy to answer any questions that you may have or inquiries about our program. Well, Natalia, I want to let you know it's been great having you, and so thank you for coming and sharing about the organization. Continue the great work. Looking for great things coming from you in the near future. I mean, you're already doing great things. Great her. How about that? Greater things coming to you in the near future. Thank you so much. A pleasure to be on today. All righty. Well, I want to let you know we come to the end of our show today. hope that you enjoyed this week's discussion on the Bronx Social Justice Forum. Now to rewatch this uh, week's edition, you can recatch the cable cast right here on Bronxnet.org. If you want to join the conversation, present your point of view, do it on social media, Bronxnet TV. Join us next week. We'll continue to elevate the discussion, bring further awareness across the globe. I'm your host, Darren Jaime, saying take care. God bless. Mm-hmm.